Let me share my screen. Um, So can everybody see the screen? Okay, yes. uh, thank you. So thanks a lot, Federico. Um, so today I'll talk about um, uh, probing the epoch of reionization with uh, a new technique, which is called the line intensity mapping technique. Um, and uh, um, so let's start here. Um, so let's start um, with the most basic question <clears throat> for, this, for this talk, um, what is line intensity mapping? So <clears throat> there are several galaxy surveys which have been undertaken in the past years. For example, STSS is a local galaxy survey. There's uh, soon uh, uh, there's DESI, uh, you know, um, and, and and there's and there is also going to be some high redshift surveys with the Hyper Supreme Cam, for example, and Lyman Alpha emitter surveys. Uh, but what the line intensity mapping technique does is it does not focus on individual galaxies but it rather tries to take an all sky image of, uh, of emission in any particular frequency band. Uh, for example, on the left here is, uh, I will, uh, let's say the red points are galaxies uh, in, this, uh, in a survey volume. And then the right is kind of uh, what you would see if you just uh, under resolve this whole volume and just look at the emission of all the uh, collective emission of all the galaxies in this volume. So for example, if you're looking at uh, H alpha, then this is just a low resolution image of all the H alpha that you see in this particular survey volume. And just like the cosmic microwave background, you can look at the fluctuations in, these, uh, uh, in this emission to uh, the statistics of fluctuations in this emission to gather some information about uh, about um, the large scale structure in the universe. And since you're also looking at uh, H alpha uh, emission lines from the galaxies themselves, you can also say something about the galaxies, uh, not just the large scale structure. So you can basically constrain both astrophysics and cosmology using this line intensity mapping technique. So um, why am I talking about line intensity mapping during the epoch of reionization? Well, because uh, during the epoch of ionization, you also have emission from the 21 centimeter line, uh, which is the spin flip transition of, of neutral hydrogen. Um, so the background emission from the lower density IGM will be, can be uh, measured from the 21 centimeter line. And you can also measure um, intensity, map, uh, uh, intensity mapping measurements from the galaxies themselves, such as O2, O3, H alpha, and H beta. Uh, and CO and C2. Um, so you can, what you can do is uh, you can measure the reionization process because as soon as you reionize the some region around a galaxy, it becomes dark in 21 centimeter, but bright in uh, nebular emission lines from the galaxies themselves. Um, so the intensity mapping process allows you to map the galaxies and the reionization process that, uh, that, that is an effect of the uh, radiation from the galaxies. Uh, so it gives you a complete picture of the reionization process. Um, that's why line intensity mapping is really important during this epoch. Um, so there are a lot of uh, line intensity mapping experiments which are uh, currently online or about to come online. I show two examples here. On the left is HERA, on the right is uh, SKA. Um, so the, these two instruments are basically designed uh, to map, as I said, the 21 centimeter spin, spin flip transition of neutral hydrogen in the universe. Um, HERA has already given us uh, uh, quite good upper limits. Uh, even recently, as last year, they have come up with upper limits for the, for the uh, power spectrum of the fluctuations in the 21 centimeter, which, are, which will allow us to measure uh, the reionization process. And in the next five to 10 years or so, these two instruments will be extremely useful in measuring the topology of reionization. Um, another important instrument is FEARX, which will be launched in 2024. Um, and it has, uh, it, has a frequency it has a wide frequency coverage and it will measure uh, a lot of lines like H alpha, H beta O2, O3 and Lyman alpha. Uh, even uh, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, even at the early stages of reionization for some lines like Lyman alpha and O2, 
and the end stages of reionization like O3, H alpha, and H beta. So it has access to multiple emission lines from the galaxies themselves. Um, so uh, this is, a, uh, as I said, this will be launched in 2024 and we'll be getting uh, a lot of data about from these lines soon. Um, and these are just a few examples. Here is a full list of examples of line intensity mapping experiments that are about to come online. Uh, so the 21 centimeter lines, uh, as I mentioned, to measure the neutral hydrogen in the universe. Uh, um, there are a lot of low redshift experiments and also a lot of high redshift experiments like HERA and SCA. Uh, then there is uh, IR, uh, basically submillimeter and IR experiments in a rest frame of the galaxy. So CO and C2, so secant prime, for example, and concerto are currently online. Uh, and uh, COMAPS also has released some data, I think, uh, in the last year. And finally, as I said, SphereX will also, uh, will also measure a lot of emission lines in the rest frame uh, optical of the galaxy. So, so in order to model what these uh, instruments will measure, uh, you need a lot of, uh, you need uh, accurate uh, reionization history and topology. Uh, you need accurate galaxy formation because uh, you need to get the right measurements for the lines themselves. Uh, you need to know how the interaction between uh, the uh, radiation from the galaxies and the IGM uh, uh, takes place and what are the sources responsible for this. Uh, you also need accurate modeling of the emission lines themselves. And you need a high dynamic range because you need to uh, understand both the properties of the galaxies, uh, you know, of order kiloparsec scales and uh, the large scale re statistics of the large scale reionization process. So hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of megaparsec scales. Um, so many people have uh, tried doing this using semi-numerical techniques. Here I show two examples. So what people usually do is um, uh, on the left here, as an example, I showed 21 centimeter emission. Um, they use something semi-numerical techniques like a 21 centimeter fast, which uses like excursion set formalism to actually uh, model the ionized bubbles around galaxies. And they use some analytic scaling relation between the halo mass and the uh, H alpha luminosity. These scaling relations are, are either obtained using uh, uh, theoretical models or even observational estimates. Uh, and then they paint on this emission onto the galaxies and their volume. Sorry, Sorry. did somebody, okay. Um, uh, they paint on this emission uh, uh, onto the galaxies in the volume and they produce these line intensity maps of H alpha on the right and 21 centimeter on the left. So this has been the state of the art for quite a while now. And the question is, can we do better? Um, so that's where my uh, the Thiessen simulations come in. Um, so we, these are large volume, high resolution radiation hydrodynamic simulations uh, that, pro, uh, that model the epoch of reionization. And as an example here, I show a light cone in the background, uh, where, which shows the evolution of gas density in blue and the gas temperature in yellow. Um, and as you go from left to right, you go from redshift about 16 to about 5.5. And you can see, you, can, you actually reionize the universe and you get the statistics of the bubbles in this large volume. You can then uh, zoom in onto a particular region, and this particular inset shows um, 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 the uh, different uh, different uh, quantities predicted self consistently from the simulation, such as uh, you know um, the temperature, metallicity, dust, and radiation fields. And if you zoom in even further you can actually make uh, mock, uh, mock images for the individual galaxies responsible for the serialization process. So this is a mock JWST image, and this is a mock ALMA image uh, measuring the C2 emission line. Um, so uh, what is uh, what goes into Thiessen? So we basically have combined uh, the illustrious TNG galaxy formation model, not the simulations, but the galaxy formation model used in TNG. Uh, which we know has accurate predictions down to redshift zero uh, with the Arepo Arte radiative transfer code, uh, which was written by me, which is extremely efficient and um, 
solves the radiation hydrodynamic equations on a uh, on the native Voronoi mesh of the uh, of the code. Um, so why are these uh, simulations powerful? Well, um, on the right on the right here we show the uh, the phase space of the the, the the simulation sit in. So on the x axis is the box size. On the y axis is the minimum cell size. Uh, as you go to the right, you have higher, larger boxes. As you go down, you have better resolution with smaller cell sizes. So most of the simulations sit on this line here. For example, uh, this is uh, the Sphinx simulation. This is Aurora and this is Croc, uh, sorry, um, Coda. And this is the Croc simulations, whereas uh, uh, the uh, the Thiessen simulation sit on the bottom right corner, which is basically what you want. You want large boxes with very high resolution, and we are able to get this uh, accurate. So just in terms of numbers, we go to a resolution of 10 parsecs at redshift 5.5, um, and uh, it has a volume of about 95.5 about homing megaparsecs. And this was done on 57,600 compute cores on the Super Mukanji supercomputer. And the good point is we resolve atomic quelling halos uh, all the way throughout the uh, volume. So this is just a movie showing how the reionization pro process proceeds in the Thiessen simulation. On the left is ionization field, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the ionization field and the right is the photon density field. So anything blue is ionized and red is neutral. And you can see how these, uh, Ionized, uh, ionized regions percolate throughout the galaxy, uh, per percolate throughout the uh, volume as, uh, as time progresses. Um, so just uh, show you that we get the right properties. Um, so we have performed not just a high resolution simulation, which we show uh, in red, but also additional simulations uh, to test how varying different parameters of the reionization process changes your uh, reionization history. So uh, the x-axis is redshift, y-axis is just the neutral fraction. So you're just showing the neutral fraction evolution as a function of redshift. So the red, as I said, is the fiducial simulation. The orange and the, um, and the green are different models where only high mass or low mass galaxies contribute to reionization. So orange line is called Thiessen high and where uh, in this model only high mass galaxies greater than 10 to the 10 solar masses have any uh, ionizing radiation escape. So only high mass galaxies contribute to reionization whereas green is the opposite. Only galaxies below 10 to the 10 contribute to the reionization process. And the brown line here is an alter alternative dark matter model. So you can also figure out how different uh, dark matter models affect your ionization history. So to show this uh, in a much better way, so we hear the, we plot the um, uh, ionized bubbles in these different simulations. So basically what you're doing is uh, you take the edge of the ionized bubbles and that is what is shown in white here. Um, so if I can go back yeah so this is a model where low mass galaxies contribute and this is high mass galaxies contribute and immediately you can see that the the nature of these ins bubbles is very very different so you have very large number of small bubbles here you have small number of large bubbles um, so you can change the ionization history just by changing how the galaxies um, <coughs> which galaxies contribute to the reionization process in general um, and the good thing about uh, including uh, an accurate uh, galaxy formation model is that we can match uh, the properties of the galaxies, the accurate properties of the galaxies. So for example, I show here on the x-axis, the halo mass, y-axis is the baryon conversion efficiency. So how much stellar mass is formed per halo mass in the galaxy. And the blue is what you expect from some kind of observational constraints. Uh, so that's the abundance matching technique from Bayerosi. Um, and the black points, uh, black lines are the Thiessen simulations. So we are kind of, we kind of get this right. Uh, whereas other simulations like uh, other reionizations, other simulations which try to model reionization like Sphinx, which is in purple here and Croc uh, from uh, Nick Gnedin's group in green, uh, they get this property wrong. 
so this is one of the fundamental properties in galaxy formation. And if you don't match this property, then, then a lot of properties of a galaxies, you cannot really accurately model them. So uh, that's the good thing about uh, TSEN simulations. We not only get the large scale reionization right, we also get the properties of the galaxies correctly, correct. Um, so let's go to the intensity mapping estimates since this talk is about intensity mapping. So here I show the 21 centimeter uh, emission. Um, so yellow is bright, blue is dark. So as you go from, um, so initially the whole of uh, the, all of the universe is neutral. So basically you get 21 centimeter emission from the whole uh, whole universe. So that's, this is at redshift 16. And on the top right here, I show the power spectrum and the redshift of evolution. So that's basically the power spectrum of the fluctuations in the 21 centimeter emission. And then I let this evolve. And then you can see initially, uh, as you punch holes into this neutral distribution and you ionize the gas, you form these ionized bubbles around the galaxies, um, which kind of percolate out and reduce the 21 centimeter emission. And you can see how the power spectrum evolves as, as you go along. And finally, only the high density filaments and knots are basically uh, neutral, whereas the rest of the universe at the end is fully ionized. So in a more quantitative manner, this is the evolution of the power spectrum uh, of the 21 centimeter power spectrum uh, as a function of uh, redshift. So uh, the redshift and ionization fraction so darker colors are higher redshift and lower ionization. Lighter colors are lower redshift and higher ionization. And on top, I pl plot the sensitivity limits of LOFAR, HERA, and SCA at different redshifts. And you can see that uh, uh, they have, these instruments have enough sensitivity to measure this, uh, this signal, the signal uh, due uh, almost all throughout the reionization epoch. And so we should expect a measurement soon. So as I said, we can all we can uh, basically get different reionization topologies <clears throat> if you have different reionization models. So on the left, I show a reionization model where low mass halos contribute to reionization. On the right, where high mass halos contribute to reionization. If you calculate the ionized fraction, it's the same in both this both simulations at this point in time but the reionization topology is very, very different. So basically by looking at just by measuring the topology of reionization, you can kind of understand which galaxies are responsible for the reionization process. And so this is what we quantify here. So this is the slope of the power spectrum uh, at, at uh, K of 0.2. Uh, so basically we are measuring the slope in this regime here. Um, and you can see that the different reionization models give you a different slope as a function of ionized fraction. And just by measuring the slope, um, you, can, uh, you can constrain the different uh, reionization histories. Um, so that was just the 21 centimeter line. Uh, I said you can also do the, you can also measure emission uh, line intensity mapping of emission lines. So there are a lot of emission lines that come out of the galaxy. Uh, from the H2 region, you have, uh, which is the highly ionized region in the galaxy uh, around massive stars. You have a lot of uh, lines coming from these ionized regions. You have PDRs, uh, the photo dissociation regions, which are just outside these H2 regions, um, where you get many of the IR lines, like the C2 line, for example, is dominant there. And then you have GMCs, which gives you molecular lines like CO and H2. And then atomic gas gives you H1. So there are a lot of emission lines that come out of the galaxy and there is a need for modeling these emission lines. And that's what we have done. So using the galaxies themselves, since we know that the galaxies are accurately modeled in the TSEN simulations, we use, uh, uh, we use a, a mixture of cloudy models to paint H2 regions into the galaxy and Monte Carlo radiative transfer code skirt to measure emission lines. For example, this is a mock JWST image and for one of the galaxies in the simulation. And then we can also measure H alpha O3 uh, in the optical, O3 in the IR, and also C2 in the IR. Um, so you, ca you, can, uh, uh, you can then make, uh, so what this gives you is an SED of the galaxy, both uh, intrinsic and dust corrected SED. 
And then you can measure all the emission lines that will be emitted from the galaxy themselves. And then make scaling relations uh, for how the luminosity of these different lines, O2, H beta, O3, H alpha, and all the different lines that I showed here as a function of star formation rate of the galaxy. And um, for example, let's take the H alpha line here. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, green, the green lines are from, uh, from Thiessen. The black is the fit to the data, and the red is the Kennecott relation from redshift zero. And immediately you can see that uh, there are differences from what uh, people generally use, mainly because at high redshift, you have lower metallicities at low star formation rates, which means your ionizing output from stellar population synthesis models is higher. So you ba basically get higher H alpha luminosities. And at higher um, um, uh, star formation rates, you have dust extinction. And so that's why these uh, uh, H alpha luminosity flatten out. Um, so, uh, so, and you get this kind of a change from what people generally use at low redshift uh, in all the lines that we measure here. Okay, so once you have these scaling relations from all the galaxies in your volume, um, you can make line intensity maps uh, like the one I showed in the beginning. So on the top is the 21 centimeter intensity map. This is the H alpha intensity map and the same volume. This is the O3 intensity map and this is the O3, the IR intensity map. So you can see that as I showed before, uh, it is bright in 21 centimeters in the beginning, uh, but then it as, as you get more and more ionization, uh, the 21 centimeter kind of vanishes um, and you get most of the 21 centimeter emission from remaining neutral pockets or from filaments, which also contains galaxies. So you can see that a bright 21 centimeter filament will also be bright in H alpha because you have both neutral gas and galaxies in the same position. Whereas the voids are basically void in H alpha and the 21 centimeter basically. Um, so um, you can make very accurate emission line maps for a lot of different observables. And then you can try to constrain reionization using this process. So what I plot here is as a function of the wave number, uh, the cross correlation function between 21 centimeter emission and C2 emission for the different reionization models that I show here and that I uh, mentioned before. Um, and so at, at an ionization fraction of 0 0.8, 0 0.5 and uh, 0.2, um, and you can see that uh, as ionization progresses, your, um, your transition may, okay, so before that. So the solid lines are ne means negative correlation between these two emission line maps. And the dashed line means positive correlation between these emission line maps. So the reason you get positive correlation at low wave number um, um, uh, is because they boast most of the neutral regions. Um, uh, most of the neutral regions also contain the galaxies, so they are positively correlated. Whereas, uh, uh, or sorry, high wave number. At low wave number, uh, it is negatively correlated because the uh, neutral regions are in voids, whereas the galaxies are in the high density filaments. So you get this negative correlation turning into positive correlation. And there is some kind of a transition wave number uh, which transitions between these two. And, the, and you can immediately see that the point in which this transition happens is different for different reionization models. So the orange is a reionization model where high mass galaxies dominate. And the red is a reionization model where low mass galaxies dominate. For a same ionization fraction, um, you actually have different transition wave numbers. So you, if you can measure the cross correlation function, um, which, you, which, will, which we can probably do with these upcoming instruments, you can actually constrain the reionization uh, uh, properties of the reionization uh, in a very accurate manner. So this is what I quantify here. For example, I plot the transition wave number as a function of neutral fraction uh, uh, in our reionization models, sorry. Um, so, as I said, if you have very high, um, if you have only a high mass galaxies contributing to reionization, no matter what line you're looking at, the cross correlation, 
the transition wave number is always small. Whereas if you have a model like green or red, where low mass galaxies contribute, <clears throat> then the transition wave number varies more rapidly um, and you get uh, more, uh, and, the, and the wave number is higher in general than in this model. And the brown is an alternative dark matter model. So you can see even you can even constrain dark matter using this kind of method, the nature of dark matter. So uh, I will conclude here. So Thiessen, uh, these are large volume reionization simulations that allow us to predict both the large scale reionization observables and the sources responsible for it in great detail. Uh, you can make accurate predictions for galaxy properties like stellar masses, luminosity functions, and metallicity distributions. And because you have both the reionization process and accurate galaxy properties, you can make line intensity mapping predictions for 21 centimeter and the levelar emission lines. And using these, these uh, intensity mapping measurements, you can as constrain both astrophysics and cosmology. So looking forward, um, right now we only have measurements of, uh, we have only made uh, predictions for intensity, uh, for emission line measurements for in the rest frame uh, optical of the galaxy. So basically, uh, yeah. But we, uh, we do not have measurements, uh, predictions yet for IR lines like uh, C2 or CO. And we also do not have um, uh, predictions for resonant emission lines like Lamin alpha. Uh, and we are in the process of doing all these three. Um, so the reason why we cannot do C2 properly is because we cannot model PDRs and CO because we do not have a model for molecular gas. But as I said, we are trying to correct for that now. Uh, Lyman alpha is another pro problem because it requires, a, it is a resonant line. Um, and so it requires a resonant line radiative transfer calculations through the ISM of the galaxy. And because we use an equation of state, uh, this is not currently possible, but we are making uh, some, uh, we are improving our models to make this better. And finally, uh, we are also trying to make uh, emission line predictions from first principles with accurate ISM models. Uh, that have uh, that can model the cold phase of the ISM. So, for example, the, we are using the smuggle model, which our Federico has worked on as well. So, uh, thank you. Oops. Thanks a lot, Raul, for this.